Yeah. Okay. And just to let me, uh, Sanjit, you started recording. So just a little bit of a background of Nora. Nora is a Moroccan national and she's based out of Dubai for the past 13 years. She's been working as a product manager in IT hardware. She holds a degree in marketing and occupational psychology. And she enjoys learning new things and connecting with people with different backgrounds. And also she's very passionate about art, personal development and analytical psychology. She's a CTA student at level one, a certified professional coach, uh, and she's under training and mentoring with Franda, our faculty of. Uh, what else, Nora, would you like to share about yourself before I hand it over to you? Uh, well, that's it really. I mean, what's relevant to the topic that I'll be covering today is that uh, I'm based in Dubai. Um, I've been in Dubai for the 13 for 13 years now, and uh, um, that's actually what uh, really encouraged me to learn more about cultural diversity, uh, cultural intelligence, and that's what I want to share with with you today. Thanks, and over to you, Nora, with this. Excited to Sorry? learn from you. I'm saying excited to learn from you. And Thank over you. To you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Noura and I'll start sharing my screen right away. Just... Okay, can you just tell me if you can see my screen? Yeah, we can see and uh, you can put it on a presentation board. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. All right, perfect. Perfect. Great. Okay, so thank you so much everyone for joining. Uh, the topic that I'll be covering today is cultural intelligence. And the reason why I chose this topic is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's been 13 years uh, for me here in Dubai. Uh, and the one thing that I enjoy the most about living in Dubai is the cultural diversity that I'm constantly uh, exposed to, both at personal level and at work as well. And it goes without saying that it has a lot of advantages, uh, but it also comes with a set of challenges and challenges that all of us could relate to, and challenges that even organizations can uh, relate to. And this is why I think cultural intelligence is one of those skills that is very uh, essential to uh, operate in today's world for both individuals and organizations, and this is why I chose to talk about it. So my presentation will be uh, split into three parts. First, uh, we will learn about culture. What is the definition of culture? What are the, diff the different components of culture? Uh, what is cultural intelligence, which is the core topic of today's presentation? And we will end with why is cultural intelligence important and relevant? So first, uh, let's start with the culture, with the definitions for culture. And uh, I think any one of us could really relate to the fact that culture is this abstract thing that is very difficult to uh, define uh, because, uh, and I read this somewhere, uh, it's very interesting uh, definition for culture or a metaphor for culture. And it says, culture is like this backpack that we always carry with us wherever we go. And it's a backpack that we are only aware of when we are facing or interacting with people from different cultures. And that's when we're really aware of the different components of our own cultures and also the differences between our culture and that of others. So what is culture? And culture is this topic that is uh, that was studied by different disciplines and different scholars. So you'll find many definitions uh, for this construct. Let me just move this window. I just minimize it. Okay. So first definition from anthropology. Culture is that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, arts, morals, law, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by a man as a member of society. It's also the shared knowledge and schemes created by a set of people for perceiving, interpreting, expressing, and responding to social realities around them. Other definition from uh, social psychology and organizational psychology, 
are the collective programming of the mind that distinguishes the members of one group or category of people from another. Culture of a group can be defined as a pattern of shared basic assumptions learned by a group to be taught to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel in relation to those problems. And this applies more to organizational culture, but also to the typical culture as defined by national identity. So what conclusions can we draw from these different definitions? First of all, culture, culture is related to a collective. It's a collective phenomenon, meaning that it's a group. It's important at group level and it's learned at group level. It's something that we can inherit and learn by interacting from people around us and it starts at a young age. In simple words, it can be put as the way we do things around here. Cultural differences can be based and noticed via many attributes. It could be language, ethnicity, nationality, or social class. And these are a few examples. Culture subconsciously guides our behavior and thoughts and often influences our sense of belonging, motivation, and effectiveness at work. So some context to the, to the presentation or to the notion of culture. Why is culture so important today? So we live today in a world that's uh, interconnected all the time. The notion of national boundaries still exists, but people, businesses, products and services, and also information, forms of art, navigate or cross the boundaries, these national boundaries all the time. You have more and more companies that not only sell their products at an international level, but also recruit internationally. Um, most of the multinational companies and transnational companies expect the growth in revenue to come from overseas, from emerging markets. And so they ship to these emerging markets, but they also recruit from emerging markets. Uh, political and economical unrest in many countries caused increased immigration. So we see diversity everywhere, in the workplace, in society, uh, in schools as well. Increased workforce mobility. There are many opportunities uh, that come up every day in the corporate world to have uh, regional uh, roles, uh, such as international uh, global leader, uh, regional sales managers, more and more people have to deal with uh, multicultural teams in the workplace uh, and this presents a set of man of, sorry of challenges to everyone managers uh, hr practitioners but also employees so while diversity cultural diversity is inevitable today and it definitely prevent, presents a lot of um, advantages to both individuals and companies managing it properly can be the difference between an international success or an international embarrassment that goes viral online. And so the question here is, how can some individuals be so successful navigating cultural diversity, interacting with people from different cultures and replicating their successes in many cultures or in many countries while others just simply can't? The other question is, while cultural sensitivity and awareness are useful, are they enough? Is it enough to be aware of our own culture and cultural differences to know exactly how to interact with people from different cultures, to know how to sell to countries from other cultures in the context of businesses? And so this is why cultural intelligence is a very important construct today. So what is cultural intelligence? The abbreviation for cultural intelligence is CQ, just like EQ is the abbreviation for um, emotional intelligence. So cultural intelligence is this ability to function effectively in culturally diverse settings involving interactions with individuals from different nationalities or ethnicities. So for uh, the sake of simplif simplification or simplicity in this presentation, you'll see that often uh, culture is equated to national identity. It's just to make it easy to think of examples. So someone who scores high in cultural intelligence is someone who is able 
to function effectively, smoothly, and in a positive manner while interacting with people from different cultures. And cultural intelligence is a skill. It can be acquired, developed, and also can be measured. There is a cultural intelligence inventory that you can take online. It can be seen as a pro the process of identifying, embracing, reasoning, and reacting appropriately to cultural cues in, in cross-cultural interaction. So it's not just one thing, it's a set of skills that fall under the construct on, or of cultural intelligence. And there is a wealth of research uh, out there. There are, I think, more than 100, there are more than 100 um, studies and peer-reviewed uh, academic papers published about cultural intelligence, how it was developed as a, as a construct, how it can be measured and also what cultural intelligence consists of and it's four dimensions and the four dimensions are cq which stands for cultural intelligence so cq drive cq knowledge strategy and action and the four of these components make up cultural intelligence so starting with the drive and drive is another word for motivation cq drive is your level of interest persistence and confidence during multicultural interactions. CQ knowledge is your understanding about how cultures are similar and different. CQ strategy is your awareness and ability to plan for multicultural interactions. CQ action is your ability to adapt when relating and working in multicultural contexts. So if we put these in question, CQ drive is how motivated are you to adjust when you have to deal with people from different cultures? Knowledge is how much do you know about other cultures? Strategy is how aware are you of your mental processing? And action is how flexible are you to implement new behavior to make the interaction successful? So starting with the first dimension, which is CQ drive, as in cultural intelligence motivation. It refers to the individual's motivation to adapt and adjust to a new culture by directing attention and energy towards learning about other cultures and operating in cross-cultural encounters. So it's not just pure motivation, it's also this readiness to apply focus and energy towards learning about the culture and behaving appropriately. And all of this, just serves the objective of how successful do you want the interaction to be? And there are different parts to the motivational aspect. Uh, intrinsic interests would refer to how much do you enjoy culturally diverse interactions and situations? And you can think here of people who enjoy traveling, people who enjoy trying food or consuming culture or art from different cultures. Extrinsic interests, so advantages that presents themselves from the environment around you. What are the tangible benefits you gain from culturally diverse experiences? Um, perhaps it allows you to grow as a person. Um, maybe more exposure allows you to be a better international manager. Perhaps having a high CQ motivation will make you the perfect candidate for um, international sales manager or regional country manager or regional manager in a big organization. And finally, self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is just another word for um, self-esteem or self-confidence. How confident are you in your ability to be effective in these situations? Because some people are highly motivated, but they lack the self-confidence. Um, maybe they were never exposed to a person from a specific country before and now they have to give a presentation or uh, a sales pitch. Maybe they're not confident in the sense that they're scared of saying the wrong thing or enacting the wrong behavior during uh, a meeting. And this is very important, uh, let's say for people like HR uh, managers, people who work in the uh, training industry, HR development, and also for managers of international teams, because this, is, this really enables them to identify where, uh, what needs to be worked on with, uh, with the employee, for example. 
or at an individual level, this will help you um, understand where you need to, what you need to work on. Sometimes you understand that diversity is inevitable, that you really have to uh, perform in a sales meeting or uh, just a networking event that involves people from different countries, for example. But you need to work on your self-confidence, on your self-efficacy and believe in your ability to really um, improve cultural intelligence and improve um, the way you act or behave around people from different cultures. And as I mentioned earlier, cultural intelligence is measurable. There is a questionnaire that you can take to measure your cultural intelligence. And there are questions that measure separately each and every single dimension. So if you take the test, uh, there will be statements uh, to which your answer would be um, a score going from one to seven, I think. Uh, one being uh, completely disagree and 10 being or seven being uh, completely agree. And that's how your score would be calculated. So for cultural intelligence drive or motivation, the typical questions would be, I enjoy interacting with people from different cultures. I am confident that I can socialize with locals. I am sure I can deal with the stresses of adjusting to a culture. I enjoy living in cultures that are unfamiliar to me. I am confident that I can get accustomed to the shopping conditions in a different culture. The second dimension is uh, knowledge, cultural intelligence knowledge. And it refers to how much do you know about other cultures? It's pure information. And here you have two types of, uh, of CQ knowledge. You have knowledge or information that caters to the macro level of things. So for example, you have a meeting with a person from country X. And so macro level of knowledge would be how much do you know about the cultural norms the values, political, legal, economic systems of that country, or even how families work. And thinking about how families work can be uh, very useful for people and organizations. For example, how HR manager would design uh, compensations or things like uh, uh, medical benefits. Uh, and also to marketing people, for example, how do you need to communicate around a product that's targeted towards uh, a different country? foreign country. And then there is context specific understanding. So now you know about the macro environment or the general information about a specific country or many countries. Now you have to decide how relevant that information is to the specific type of interaction you're having. Because sometimes in organizations, let's say in multinational companies where the workplace is very diverse, the organizational culture or identity is stronger than national culture. And so maybe knowing the specifics about any given country will not be that useful because all you have to do is understand the culture of that specific company, the organizational culture. Um, another example uh, would be occupational culture. So for example, you are, let's say, a doctor or an engineer, something very specific. You are an engineer and you have a meeting with engineers from a country. How relevant will the information about their country, general information about their country, will be to your discussion if all you'll be talking about is something related to your job, to your occupation? Can you go in with the assumption that because you have the same job or the same, let's say, education, that your way of thinking would be slightly similar and that the cultural differences will not play a big role in your interaction. So these are the things that you should be mindful of or the things that you can look up while you're working on improving cultural intelligence knowledge. And this was a big topic for multinational companies in the 60s and in the 70s as more and more of them started operating um, overseas. And one of the most important uh, body of work and research was done by the late uh, social psychologist Gert Hofstede, who used to work for IBM in the 70s and who did uh, a large scale research to try to understand uh, cultural dimensions, which would be um, the cultural aspects in which countries tend to differ. 
So he interviewed um, IBM employees performing the same kind of job, but across more than 50 countries. And years and years of research later, he came up with this um, framework called the cultural dimension or the 6D cultural dimensions by Gefhoff study. So he identified six main dimensions that define a culture. And this can be used to compare between one country, one culture or another. And for his research, culture is equal to national identity. So culture would be uh, a country. So the dimension of power distance, individualism, collectivism, masculinity, femininity, uncertainty, avoidance, long-term orientation versus short-term orientation, and indulgence versus restraint. So if we go into each dimension, so the way he worked uh, with the data is that every country would have either a high, low score on each dimension. And this enabled him to just come up with this framework to help people identify the similarities and dissimilarities between the different countries that were studied. And it's also a very dynamic framework because since its first inception, other dimensions were added. In the beginning, it was just four, now it's six. And in other studies published, um, the name for some dimensions was changed. But in its essence, this is what you will find if, you ever, if you're ever interested in researching this furthermore. So for power distance, countries that score high in power dis distance tend to have a higher acceptance for hierarchy and inequalities in organizations or in societies, while those who score lower on this dimension would strive for more equal distribution of power. The second dimension, individualism, collectivism, um, is for high preference if you score high in it. So that would mean that you would have a higher preference for a loosely knit social framework. So individuals pertaining to this kind of culture would be expected to take care of themselves and maybe the immediate family. While people who score low in individualism or countries on cultures that score low on uh, individualism would have a preference for tightly knit framework in society. So this is this would be equal to uh, uh, people talking uh, using I, I do, I like, I prefer versus people talking in the name of the group. So we, we like to do, we think, uh, we prefer. This is individualism, collectivism. The third dimension, masculinity, femininity, does not refer to uh, gender role but rather um, attributes of, uh, that are attributed to the feminine aspects of a personality or the masculine aspects of a personality. So it's more personality attributes uh, with regards to a culture. So countries that score high in the first one, masculinity, would tend to favor heroism, assertiveness, material reward for success, and competition, while other countries, well, other countries on the other end of the uh, spectrum would tend to favor collaboration, harmony, and work-life balance, also caring for the weak. The fourth one is uncertainty avoidance. And uncertainty avoidance is the level to the extent to which people are comfortable with uncertainty. How much detail should your information be? Uh, are people comfortable with um, just adapting or flexible when setting a meeting, for example, or do they need specific time, specific date, specific place? Long-term orientation versus short-term orientation. So with long-term orientation, uh, people in this culture would focus on being prepared for the future. And they would be more oriented towards working hard, hard work, um, and saving for the future and freedom. While in short-term orientation, people would more put more value into social norms and conformity and some kind of groupthink as well. The last one is indulgence versus restraint. So indulgence um, means enjoying life, fun, free gratification, 
while restraint would be strict normal, uh, strict so sorry, strict social norms. So you'll find if you read more about each dimension, you'll find that the dimensions overlap in a few aspects. And this is a very useful framework if you just need uh, general information about any given country, culture, or society. Um, however, it's not meant to be used uh, in a stereotypical way. And even from the, the people who, re who published the research did mention that um, it doesn't mean if a country scores high in power distance, it doesn't mean that any person or any national of that country would exhibit the same uh, preference. So it's just what the group in general leans toward. And the framework is more to be used to identify the dissimilarities, the differences between different cultures, but it doesn't give any information about differences of nationals belonging to the same cultures. And this is how it should be used. So the typical questions to measure uh, CQ knowledge in the questionnaire would be, I know the legal economic systems, the rules, cultural values, religious beliefs of other cultures. I know the marriage system of other cultures, the art, craft, uh, the rules for expressing nonverbal behavior. So before I move to the third dimension, do you have any questions? Comments? None from me. Okay, I can't see the chat, but that's okay. Sorry. The third dimension is a cultural intelligence strategy. So now that you have information about uh, other cultures or other countries, how do you use this information makes a big difference. It makes a difference between um, a successful interaction or a very negative experience. So CQ strategy refers to the level of conscious cultural awareness and executive processing, meaning mental processing, the way we think about the information we receive, um, involved while interacting with people from different cultures. And it manifests in three ways. There's the planning aspect, the awareness, and the checking. How can you approach people, topics, and situations in light of cultural differences? Awareness. How aware are you of what is going on in your own mind during intercultural interaction? So this is, um, understanding your own or our own cultural bound thinking, what is accurate and what is not. And then checking, how does the actual experience compare to previous expectations? How well can you adjust your mental models, meaning the way you process the information appropriately? <laughs> Sorry, please go ahead. It was someone without muting. Okay, okay. And so uh, to understand what cultural intelligence strategy means, we have to understand what metacognition means. And metacognition is just another word for thinking about thinking. It's the level of awareness we apply when we think about our own mental process, how we save the information, how we interpret the information we receive or I should say how accurately we interpret the information we receive. And there are a few ideas that we can discuss here. And um, please feel free to share uh, any um, information or any experience you have. It's, it's an open forum. So to talk about metacognition is to talk about how aware are we about how we process and interpret the information we're surrounded with. And as much as we would like to think that we are rational beings, the truth is, unless we merge totally with AI, humans are anything but rational. Our mind operates in a way that enables it to save energy and to be more effective. Because on daily basis, we are constantly bombarded and exposed with millions and millions of information all the time. And so our mind becomes um, more effective by developing some kind of shortcuts 
to save the information around us. And this is what we call cognitive bias or cognitive biases, there are many of them. It's errors in thinking, errors in the way we process the information that can affect uh, the way we make decisions and the way we behave. So a few examples here um, to discuss this further. Uh, there's a very uh, popular book by psychologist Daniel Kahneman, and it's Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. And the theory in this book is that our mind uh, or our brain works with in two different systems, system one and system two. And system one is slow. System one is your default mode of operating. It's the way you think or don't think when you perform a task you're very familiar with, something you do every day. And system one is a system of thinking that's effortless. You do it automatically, that's your autopilot mode. It's like when you, uh, when you drive from home to work and you've taken the same uh, route, you've always driven the same car, so everything becomes like a second nature. You don't even have to think about it. Before you know it, you've reached work or your parking in your parking spot. System two is the opposite. System two is slow, it's deliberate. Things don't come to you automatically. You have to think about them. You have to pause, analyze, evaluate. So to keep the same uh, example of driving a car, um, system two would be triggered if you're driving, if you're taking the same road you're used to to go to work, but then there is an accident or the road is closed because of construction. And so now you have to think about a different uh, road. You have to think about a different route. And maybe you find one using Google Maps, but then how enjoyable will be the experience? Will you still just be on autopilot mode? And the answer is no, because it's unfamiliar. You, maybe you like to drive with the, uh, with the music on, but now because you'll have to think and apply awareness to the process of driving, maybe you'll switch off the music. You will pay more attention to every turn, to every traffic light, to where the traffic cameras are also. And when you reach your work, when you reach your parking spot, you will remember everything. You will remember the journey. You will remember driving. You will remember consciously making the decision of taking going down one street and not the other. And this is the difference between system one and system two. And so when you have to interact with people from different cultures, what system would you trigger? What system would you use? System one, which is habitual, so it's business as usual for you. You'll still talk the same way you usually talk. You will still use the same vocabulary, the same verbal or nonverbal communication style. Or system two, you will put a lot of awareness and a lot of thinking into the way you analyze or you receive the information from that individual and the way you think about it. And finally, the way you would translate your own thoughts into behavior. Uh, the other aspect uh, of this is, as I said, cognitive biases, which are our default mode of operation. And I know that bias has, is a word that has a bad rap uh, more so recently, but it's very important to be aware of our own cognitive biases because that's what makes the difference between uh, being able to communicate and behave appropriately in a multicultural setting or not. So for example, uh, there is a bias called confirmation bias, which means that we retain and favor information that, cons that confirms our perception and beliefs. So anything that confirms a pre-held idea or belief that I have would be the piece of information that I will focus on and remember. And any other information that contradicts it would be disregarded. And this usually happens at a very unconscious level. It doesn't mean that it's just because it's a bias that there is um, a negative intention behind it, but these kind of uh, cognitive biases usually happen automatically at a very unconscious level. And we really have to apply a lot of self-awareness, um, a lot of metacognition to, uh, to override the system, to override the system. There's also stereotyping, and stereotyping means that we adopt generalized belief about members of the same group. 
which is also kind of a shortcut that our mind uses to categorize or to save the information and remember it. And so when you apply self-awareness to your thinking process, you would be more aware about the situations where you use that, where you do that. And everybody does. There's also positive stereotyping as well as negative stereotyping. And the difference uh, in this comes from the fact that we are all able to change our behavior. We are all able to really apply awareness. It's something that can be learned and developed. So we can all apply more level of higher levels of awareness in the way we deal with the information. So I have a meeting with a person from a different country or I go to, uh, I attend, let's say a networking event and there are people from different countries. So how do I interact with them? Do I just act on the assumptions or the stereotypes that I have about people from those countries? Or do I freeze judgment and allow, allow them or allow the situation to just unfold and so I can make a judgment based on what's happening in front of me? And finally, in-group and out-group dynamics. And this is related to social identity theory, which explains how people form their in-group or out-group. So in-group would be uh, people that we perceive to be very similar to us. And culture can be one of the criteria we use for that. And in-group is also important in social identity and in sociology because the way we relate to our in-group is directly related to our sense of self-esteem. And so for us to increase our self-esteem, we tend to overestimate the similarities between people that we perceive to be in our own in-group. So we're all similar. This is my group. We're all the same. We think the same and we're all amazing. And for the self-esteem to go higher, we would tend to overestimate the differences between our in-group and our out-group. So anyone who doesn't belong to our out-group is therefore very, very different. I cannot think of one single thing we have in common. And this is again something we do on a very unconscious level. And this is something that really affects uh, for example, diversity in the workplace or even in society with now uh, issues uh, around immigration and integration uh, coming up in different parts of the world. So it's very important to understand the, these different theories and essentially apply more awareness uh, to the way uh, we, think about, um, we think about thinking, which is metacognition. And the questions related to uh, CQ strategy in the questionnaire would be, I am conscious of the cultural knowledge I use when interacting with people from different cultural backgrounds. I adjust my knowledge as I interact with these people. I am conscious of the cultural knowledge I apply. I check the accuracy, and this is very important. I check the accuracy of my cultural knowledge as I interact with people from different cultures. And the last dimension in cultural intelligence is uh, action, so behavior. And by behavior, there's both behavior, action, verbal, and, non, uh, and nonverbal. So this is the ability to implement the right and appropriate behaviors to achieve interactions objectives. What do you intend to achieve from the interaction? And CQ action is very specific to cultural context. The appropriate behavior in one cultural setting, in one cross-cultural event or communication meeting or networking event would not be appropriate for others. It's very culture and context specific. So the questions here are when to adapt to another culture and when not to adapt. So the idea here is don't overdo it first. And two, how much should you adapt as well? And what actions will support you? And we will talk about this in a bit. By actions, it could be speech acts, vocabulary, or idioms. Um, suppose you speak English as your first language and you're extremely fluent. That's the first language you've ever learned. But you have to give a presentation to foreign nationals representing a potential customer or potential big deal. 
So when you design your presentation and when you perform the presentation, do you use the same vocabulary you usually used to? Or do you simplify it? Do you adapt the vocabulary to suit people from different cultures? Do you use idioms which would only be understood by people sharing your own cultures? What about the pace of your speech, the tone of your voice? What about facial expressions and body language? So there are cultures who score very high in one of the cultural dimensions called uh, high context. And high context cultures tend to place a big preference or a big importance on face-to-face uh, -face interactions and also on nonverbal communication. So for example, if someone is excited, would you notice a difference in the, uh, uh, in the tone of the voice or in the body language or does neither changes either way? So this is very important to pay attention to. Uh, what about other behaviors? So what's the protocol with exchanging business cards? Do you take time to read the business card, acknowledging the person who's sharing their business card, or do you just put it on your desk right away? What about small talk? When you go into a meeting, a business meeting that is, uh, is it okay to just start the meeting with casual small talk and then going to the, moving to the agenda? or are small talk not really viewed positively in that specific culture? So CQ action is really behavior. And the items from the questionnaire would be, I change my verbal behavior, accent, tone, when a cross-cultural interaction requires it. I vary the rate of my uh, speaking when a cross-cultural situation requires it. I change my nonverbal behavior. I alter my facial, my facial expressions. So now that we've covered the different dimensions of cultural intelligence, how do you work on your cultural intelligence? How can you improve it? So you can start by taking the assessment online to identify your strengths and weaknesses, what you have working for you already or what you need to develop. You can reflect on previous experiences um, how much time have you spent abroad? How much time have you spent interacting with people from different countries or different cultures? You can reflect on the challenges you faced and think of how the cultural dimensions, knowledge, drive, uh, energy, action might have helped produce results. You can reflect on your own long-term goals in terms of career, for example. So, um, do you, are you interested in becoming the next regional sales manager in your company? Are you interested in being the leader of a, an international sales team or research and development team, marketing team? Um, personal goals could be, do you want to live abroad? Are you contemplating uh, taking an expatriate assignment elsewhere or just simply immigrating? How much do you enjoy traveling? visiting countries that are completely different from, you, from your home country. And finally, develop action plan around uh, what stood out for you during the reflection and the things you've learned from uh, the cultural intelligence dimension. Okay, the last part of the presentation is why is cultural intelligence important and relevant today? Um, do you have any questions? Does anybody want to share anything about their personal experience? Okay. I think it was very wonderfully, um, you know, uh, your presentation, how intellectually most of the things that I was not aware of this intercultural intelligence, uh, you made it so simple. And yes, there are a lot of things that I feel that we need to learn in this uh, intercultural existence of our, and if you are working with multicultural nationalities. Yes. Uh, one thing that I want to know, uh, because you have 13 years of experience and I'm experiencing like my journey to Dubai is almost six months. Okay. So how do you uh, feel uh, from your personal experience 
uh, that was very intellectually you know if we see the presentation but experience was different so mm-hmm. how would you say that uh, what one should have in mind while you know coexisting in this multicultural uh, professionalism and how personally we can have different uh, flavors of uh, cultural how we can you know um, gel in well in this multicultural scenarios sure sure thank you sana thanks for your question um so to me if i were to apply or to think about my personal experiences using the cultural intelligence dimensions um if i start with my personality i've always enjoyed uh learning more about other cultures uh watching movies from different countries uh, as far as i remember i never had any problem watching a movie in a foreign language and just reading the subtitles i was always mm-hmm. curious about this like how how were different languages formed how are we uh, why are we also different yet similar at the same time things that we have in common with other cultures things that are completely different so i was always curious about this and so when i got this opportunity to come to dubai um i must say i wasn't really i wasn't really intimidated by the diversity at first but of course when you're confronted with it in the workplace and in daily life it's a completely different story um as you said sometimes it's very it's very challenging um because diversity affects the communication styles and i mean although my first language is arabic but i speak the arabic spoken in morocco which is very different than the arabic from the middle east so um for me the first challenge was to adapt to that because at first i couldn't really understand the different uh the different arabic dialects um also english uh, back in morocco I, i was hardly using any english so that's also something i had to work on and here in dubai you have different uh kinds of accents and you have to navigate those and really develop your ability to understand them and ask questions in a polite manner so not to offend uh, people around you that's another thing so for me the the most uh important thing about cultural intelligence and the most important dimension is the strategy one because the one of the biggest um challenges about working and living in a multicultural environment is navigating the differences and um not engaging in stereotypes and also knowing how to react when people are uh when are you you are being stereotyped in a negative way so for example when you know about the cognitive uh biases that people often react to pieces of information in a very automated way and you, you would know for example you would be able to react more let's say productively and positively to different kind of situations that are in their essence negative um you will also realize that sometimes uh, well in my case i realized that i often make assumptions that are not correct uh for example in different uh, uh business meetings and business trips um i was also i was sometimes very frustrated that i had to start the conversation but that people would not really respond or that maybe people were not really seem not to be very friendly but then when you apply uh metacognition and thinking about thinking you often find that some people don't uh, don't approach you maybe because they don't know in what language they would have to communicate with you and that happened to me so many times it's i started the conversation and the other the other person from a different culture would be like oh you speak english i didn't i i couldn't tell and that would be an ice breaker for example the other one is that sometimes um there are a lot of misunderstanding about different cultures and some people are very conscious of that and so they don't approach people from other cultures not because they don't want to not because they don't like them but because they're scared of offending them and this is something that happens very very often uh it's like i'm sorry i want to talk to you i wanted to mention this but i i didn't know how to uh i know nothing about your culture 
Or sometimes people use uh, stereotypical information about a specific culture as an icebreaker. And to them, they don't understand that it's wrong because they don't know much about your culture, for example. So it's really, for me, the most important thing is really applying the self-awareness uh, during these kind of uh, interactions. I hope I replied to your question. <laughs> Oh, she said I have to leave. Okay, okay. All right, so I'll just go on with the last part of the presentation. Uh, so, uh, characteristics of cultural intelligence as a skill and a construct. So, this is a strong theoretical um, work. Uh, it's a framework that's backed by studies and it's empirically proven to be uh, the answer to cultural diversity issues. It can be measured. There is a questionnaire. You can try to take the questionnaire and see how fair you score. It can be developed and enhanced through experiences and training. And it's also a transferable skill. So if you apply cultural, cultural intelligence to uh, an interaction with a specific, uh, let's say, culture, you can replicate the experience focusing on the same uh, dimensions uh, with any other culture. Who can benefit from it? So uh, HR practitioners, global leaders, regional managers, expatriates, people who are considering international careers, moving abroad, immigrating, uh, multicultural teams, foreign students, and even coaches or executive coaches. And in fact, I found a very interesting research paper um, that focuses on a coaching international team and uh, the challenges of interacting with or coaching uh, a group where cultural diversity is very high. And what the authors of the study did is that they um, worked with the ICF competencies, three of them actually, and uh, formulated some kind of suggestions and rec recommendation into what could help with increasing uh, cultural competencies and cultural intelligence. And so just going through them, I could already tell that they did work with the cultural intelligence dimensions in different situations here. So for example, with regards to establishing trust intimacy with the, and intimacy with the client or the clients, um, they mentioned develop greater awareness and comfort with our own com cultural biases. And that's CQ strategy. That's applying awareness to the thinking process. Active listening, mirror language proficiency in the face, in the face that you speak. So this is cultural intelligence action. That's the behavior, um, verbal and nonverbal. Consider high risk of language ambiguity. Ensure team shares understanding. So this is also with regards to uh, cultural intelligence action. And finally, powerful questioning. They crossed it with sensitivity to potential loss of face, sensitivity or around cultural taboo matters. So here we have knowledge and uh, cultural intelligence knowledge and behavior, and also focus on clearly understood questions. So you should ask questions in a way that leaves no room to ambiguity. And that's it for me now. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I've really enjoyed sharing this information with you. Um, if anyone is interested in um, the articles or published research papers, please get in touch with me. This is my LinkedIn handle. I've also um, mentioned some of the sources in the last slide. Thank you so much. And feel free if you have any questions or um, anything you'd like to share. Uh, I want to say thank you, Nora, for this amazing uh, presentation. It was very enlightening, uh, especially to me. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, because I've lived in Dubai for like nine years and worked there. And 
as you were explaining, especially coming to the bits where you talked about how we sh people should adapt the way they talk, mm -hmm. body language, the way they approach people in small talks and so on. Uh, it reminded me of many awkward moments that I went through in the beginning, <laughs> understanding the different cultures and trying to understand how I would fit with the mixture and how nervous I felt in the beginning. Uh, but I've learned a lot from this presentation. And especially when you talked about the high, uh, people who scored high and people who scored low based on where they come from, that was very like the, my aha moment. <laughs> Thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Sana, my pleasure. And Nora, yes, Nora. I'm sorry, go ahead, Fatima. Yeah, I just want to thank you, Noura. Um, it was really insightful to know uh, the science behind the uh, culture intelligence. We, we thought that we have that in our life, on, in our daily life. But uh, when we know more about the science behind it, it's more complicated than what we thought, actually, or mainly what personally I, I thought about it. And uh, as a, um, I'm from Syria, born in Kuwait, studied in Jordan, and get married to Egyptian. So, <laughs> <laughs> so personally, it's a very mixed culture, even though it's all uh, from the Middle East. But, uh, however, it's very important to know the science behind the culture intelligence. So, thank you. Really, thank you, Inouda. My pleasure. Thank you for attending. And Nora, I was just going to say as well, just thank you so much. It was it's so informative. I can't wait to um, go back and, and study a little bit more. I was comparing it a lot to NLP and what we've been, you know, been teaching with that. and, and um, so yeah, just really, really good. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. And it's true. It's, uh, there are a lot of aspects of NLP and also emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's like everything is really interlinked. Uh, sorry, just one quick question, Nora. Um, yeah. How can I have access to the test that you mentioned yeah, during the presentation? Ask. Oh, I'll share the link. Um, I think you can take the Professor, test. Uh, uh, for everyone, uh, Nora, you will share it with Sanjit. And Sanjit yes. will put that in a drive. And you will put the link of that drive on, on, uh, on Facebook group. And people can access. And if you want to share more material as well, I mean, if you have something else to, for people to read, uh, slides, presentation, books, article, you can put that together and we'll put on Facebook so people can access from there. Sure, okay, okay, perfect. No. So Sana, is that good for you? Are you a member of the group? Yes, I am, thank you very much. It will be posted there. Uh, Nora, I, I would only tell you one thing that was just an amazing, very informative, and I think must have presentation for all of us who work, especially in a country like Dubai or in GCC overall. I think uh, you made a lot of things which were not even known clear today. A big thanks for, for such an amazing presentation. Thank you, my pleasure. I'm, I'm happy that was the objective. Thank you, thank you. And you meet that objective very well. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Noura. And thank you everyone for joining us today and see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. bye everyone. Bye. bye.